Testing. Testing, testing. Hello. Hello. Testing. One, two, three. Yeah. Yeah. Testing. Call this meeting to order at 6.07 p.m. We're going to do roll call. Uh, I am here. Vice President Ross is on Zoom from 8, I'm sorry, 233 St. Thomas Drive, Oak Park, California, 91377. Present. All right. Uh, Ms. Helfstein? Here. Ms. Hardy? Here. Ms. Wang? Here. Okay, we're all here. Mr. Or Dr. Davis? Here. And your staff are here? Yes, they are. Okay. All right, let's stand up and do the flag salute. So report of closed session actions taken. So in closed session tonight for item A.1, the board voted unanim unanimously to approve the hiring of Tammy Barrera Herzog as the assistant superintendent of educational services effective July 1st, 2022. The board took no other action in closed session tonight and also took no action at the closed session on June 1st. So. Congratulations, Tammy, and welcome to the Oak Park family. We're looking forward to working with you for many years to come, if you're out there watching. All right, and then adoption of the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, adoption of the agenda. And then public comments, speakers on agenda items? No, okay. All right, let's get started. So uh, Act B, item B1A, public hearing and board review, proposed 2022-2023 Oak Park Unified School District Local Control and Accountability Plan. So I'm gonna open this um, public hearing at 6.10 p.m. And I'm going to ask if there's any comments, public comments. If not, do I close it now? Okay. So I'm going to close this hearing at 6, 10 p.m. And I will hand it off to Dr. Hamer. All right. Thank you, President uh, Hazelton. 
Uh, good evening, board, uh, Dr. Davis, uh, and everyone who's watching. Um, and congrats to uh, Ms. Herzog. Uh, um, if you're watching this, uh, this will be your baby uh, starting July 1st, so pay careful attention. Um, <clears throat> uh, at the conclusion of the public hearing, um, it's uh, appropriate for the board to have an open discussion, a study session on the uh, uh, local control and accountability plan, and we'll do that today. And I have uh, just a brief presentation with some uh, some 35,000 foot discussion and then also a few details. And then I know that there'll wanna be some uh, questions and discussion about some items within uh, the LCAP. So we'll be able to, we'll be able to uh, discuss those, those points as well. Um, so in just a minute, um, we'll pull up the pre we'll pull up our presentation. Uh, but before we do that, um, at last year at this time, we uh, were adopting uh, a brand new LCAP. So every three years, uh, we go through a cycle of renewing our LCAP. And uh, just as a reminder, some of the major changes to uh, the Oak Park Unified LCAP is that we rearranged the goals and actions to better align with the identified board and district goals, um, which has helped a great deal in our collection of data related to metrics, um, and has also aided us in um, uh, kind of corroborating our expenses uh, on the business side because everything aligns a little bit uh, nicer. And uh, with those changes, um, we adopted our LCAP and now we're at the end of this year. And so on an annual basis, the board is obliged to review the LCAP, review metrics uh, related to the actions and goals and um, uh, make decisions about actions, uh, expenditures, and goals as it relates to the uh, uh, district budget, which will come before you uh, in just a few minutes here. So uh, different than last year when we were, re, uh, we were adopting a brand new LCAP, uh, an annual update uh, of reflects on the progress towards goals and metrics, as I said. Um, many of the metrics, as the board has noted, um, are not completely filled in. A lot of the metrics, uh, we've wisely decided to align them with the California School Dashboard. Um, but in, uh, uh, I would say, uh, familiar fashion with the state, um, many of the timelines that the state operates on are, are not in conjunction with the other actions that we have to take. Um, so while we rely on California School Dashboard data for many of our metrics, those dashboards take data from the current school year um, and typically come out in preview mode in, uh, they've come out in August once, but typically September and then our public, public in October. And so that's when we have the final um, uh, data related to many of the metrics. Um, and some of those uh, were brought up uh, in previous questions by board members um, as to you know, how we're gonna use that data to inform decisions. And while some of those decisions um, uh, we can make now on actions and expenditures, um, we also want to make sure that we have a flexible plan that can uh, that can react to the data as it comes. We also look in this document uh, at this year's estimated versus expend expected expenditures. So last year at this time, we ex we uh, made predictions about what we would spend on certain actions. And now thanks to Byron's hard work um, in the business office, we have estimated uh, expenditures for this year. And those are reflected in the estimated actuals that uh, that drive um, that are the beginning steps for the budgeting for next year. We also um, are able to add, obviously, actions and expenditures to meet the needs as they've changed since last year. Um, we can also identify expenditures or actions to be removed from the LCAP. And um, then we begin to discuss our projected expenditures for the next year, again, aligning with the budget that will be presented uh, by Mr. Rauch later on. And then um, probably the most important point of the LCAP and the purpose of the LCAP is for school districts to identify how they're going to meet um, increased and improved uh, services for unduplicated pupils. And undu unduplicated pupils would be um, uh, multilingual students, students in low socioeconomic circumstances, and foster youth. And so that being the main purpose of the LCAP, um, it's important that throughout the LCAP document, we highlight when expenditures are meeting those increased or improved uh, required expenditures. Um, as a note, as you'll see in Mr. Rauch's presentation later on, the increased diversity of Oak Park's student body uh, is resulting in increased, unduplicate, or increased, increased supplemental funding, um, which is a wonderful thing because it brings more funding to students who, needs it, who need it. 
Um, but then it also uh, allows us to make decisions to add services, to add actions uh, at our school sites and within our district to meet student needs. Um, and so uh, the first LCAP that uh, I helped uh, write in 2016 and 17, our um, supplemental funding was in the area of four to $500,000. And then this year, it's closer to 1.2 million. Um, so that speaks to the state's commitment to supporting students, but it also speaks to the increased diversity of our student body. Um, and this this slide has been in every LCAP presentation, just to, to remind everyone about the many steps that take place. Um, this this will be the third of three third of four times that the board uh, uh, views or reviews and discusses the LCAP. Um, this study session is a requirement uh, by the Ed Code for there to be a public hearing, a study session on the budget and LCAP prior to approval at a regularly scheduled uh, board meeting, which would be next. Uh, Tuesday, June fourteenth, and so you can see we've uh, slowly moved down that timeline uh, to the penultimate step, uh, which is today's study session. And so now I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the the LCAP and some major changes and additions. Um, and I've highlighted here uh, five uh, actions and expenditures, and I want to take a little time to talk about them because they're impactful, not just budget wise, because as you can see, they're large ticket items, but they're impactful on our, kind of our core program. And when we talk about, when we look at our district goals and we talk about like, what is our main purpose um, of supporting the academic and social needs of students? Um, these actions are directly related to, to those goals. Um, and so uh, the first uh, item um, I wanna talk about is the learning support teachers. Um, as you can see here in action 1.6, and then the accompanying action of 1.21. Uh, we separate them as two actions because in the budget, we, we split fund between base LCFF funding and our supplemental funding, which is the aforementioned funding uh, that is directed at our unduplicated pupils. So this year, uh, the district really focused on meeting student needs coming out of the pandemic. Um, our efforts were substantial, as uh, you've heard throughout the year. Um, but still, there was a lot of feedback, especially related to um, how uh, our MTSS or intervention program at the elementary schools can improve. Uh, the feedback was that tier one support needs to be consistent, um, which is reflected in line two, which is the literacy and numeracy aids. And that's the direct classroom support uh, based on teacher instruction. Um, and then tier two and three, which is our intervention program, those supports are aimed at filling learning gaps that uh, may prevent a student from mastering a grade level standard. Um, so a student who has an existing skill gap that is getting in the way of them being successful in the classroom. And our, our MTSS program is aimed at uh, filling those gaps. Um, and so a lot of the feedback that we received is that uh, the current um, staffing of the hourly teacher in the intervention was leading to communication uh, in, uh, issues, really. Um, just not enough time for that person to be interfacing with teachers and with parents and sharing information and data about student progress. Um, we also recognized that a, a part-time hourly teacher um, was not allowing us to meet all the most intense tier three needs of students. And those are the students who are most in need of the most qualified um, interventionist. So the creation of the learning support teacher aims to address th this major feedback about our MTSS program. Um, it'll allow us to meet more student needs, increase communication with teachers and parents, um, and will provide better alignment with other site supports, including the literacy and numeracy aids and classroom instruction. And then we'll really allow us to align practices across all three schools. So I think having a consistent program across all three schools um, allows us to develop better practices um, and speak the same language, so to speak, um, across all three schools. So we've taken great care in uh, crafting a position that's gonna be responsive to the feedback that we've received from, from many of our teachers um, and that I know uh, came up in many of the office hours that you held um, at school sites. I heard it when, in, uh, when attending the data meetings with teachers and the MTSS teams, and I believe Dr. Davis and uh, Mr. McGugan also heard similar feedback, is that it, it's a, um, an incomplete support because we, we can't round out all of the communication and kind of the support uh, pieces there. The third item uh, that we'd be adding is a piece of software and uh, it's called Elevation and the ELL is uh, intentionally misspelled um, because it uh, is per, to reflect English language learners. Um, Elevation software is a program that is used actually in every district in Ventura County, except for Oak Park currently. 
um, to monitor and support the progress of multilingual students. Um, the monitor and support, so the monitoring part is allowing us to track the progress of multilingual students over time and measuring their progress towards reclassification. Um, so the goal for all multilingual students is as soon as possible for them to be fluent English uh, proficient. And right now we have a, a, a paper format to track that, um, which is not uh, the most ideal way to track student data. And so this would allow us to cleanly monitor the progress of students. And then it also has an instructional support side so that our, uh, our multilingual support aides would be able to draw lessons and supports for students that they can use either one-on-one -on -one or things they can bring back to their classroom as supports to meet their specific language needs. Um, as we've as we've remarked at many meetings, the language diversity of our students is uh, quite unique in that we have dozens of languages and sometimes we have children who are the only people at their school who speak their specific language. And so supporting their language, their English language development needs is very unique. And so this would be a tool that would allow staff to better support um, our multilingual students. And then it also comes with uh, uh, quite a bit of training in the first year to make sure that staff are uh, brought up to speed in the use of the software. Uh, the fourth item here is to re we uh, are reclassifying the college and career counselor position to a certificated counselor position. Um, that is, I know, has been a, a very important topic for the school district for a number of years is making sure that students have social emotional, academic, but then also uh, college related uh, support on campus. And this is an a enormous step in that direction. Um, and I think we'll have uh, a significant impact on just the student experience and the support that we can provide to the students at Oak Park High School. Um, this would increase the um, full-time certificated counseling to, to six counselors. Um, and then there's uh, an additional um, item that's partially represented in the LCAP of the wellness counselor, uh, the wellness center counselor, um, which would add another FTE of secondary counseling um, for a specific purpose. Um, I'll, I'll remark on that, even though it's not, it doesn't show up on this action and expenditures, because we, we know that the wellness counselor is going to be part of our plan, uh, because the funding source is, uh, is still um, inexact. We do know that the portion of that counselor, as we do all counselors, would be reflected in our supplemental funding, and that we would um, identify uh, a portion of that person's time and effort towards meeting the needs of our unduplicated pupils. So that would raise uh, another FTE of secondary counseling um, to be if we if if the current plan is to split that person between the middle and the high school, let's just say it was 50 50 it would be it would be to 3.5 counseling FTE at the middle school and 6.5 at the high school, um, which is a significant a really significant number. And then the last is directed at uh, a, a district goal for a long time has been to rethink and remake the computer labs into more uh, makerspace and innovation based um, uh, centers. And I think uh, we've we've heard from Mr. Kwok in the past months about the need to make sure that the staffing in that in those rooms is adequate and in line with our other um, what we would call uh, kind of specialty er instructional areas such as gardening, music and art. And so the increase there for those positions uh, exists here in the LCAP as well. So uh, we're not just adding things, we're also mo moving a few things out of the LCAP. Um, and in this next slide, um, while none of these actions are ceasing themselves, uh, the, the funding source uh, we've been able to change. So the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant um, is a plan that uh, the board approved earlier this school year. Um, it, it is about $1.3 million in change. Um, directed at supporting the learning needs of staff. So this is a very staff-based funding source. It's a five-year plan, um, or it can be used all the way through five years. And so uh, we moved some of these uh, expenditures out of the LCAP and into the EEVG. Um, the challenge success training for staff and speakers. Um, this is uh, one of many actions that exists in the LCAP that is co-funded, not just by district funds, but also by uh, parent donations. This in particular, is supported by the Oak Park High School PFA. Um, and so th this is an important program for them to support as well, um, bringing in speakers. And then um, the staff side is moving to the EEVG. So speakers for staff, um, and then um, help uh, just making sure that we're implementing challenge success uh, strategies on our campuses. 
the next is the development of an ethnic studies course. Um, this will continue to be a district goal and exist in the LCAP, uh, not just because it's a district goal, but also because it's now a statutory requirement. And the, um, the costs of staff development, of materials, and of building the course are being moved to the EEVG, or were moved to the EEVG um, previously through that board action. And then another uh, area of support for teachers that's important but is moving funding sources is one of our technology TOSAs. So we have a technology TOSA, which is a 1.0 FTE, and then a lead technology TOSA, which is a 1.2. Uh, we, aim to, we aim to move the 1.0 TOSA into the EEBG, um, funding that for the next, I believe, is it two years in the EEBG, I believe. Um, so continuing with the position, but just uh, taking the funding source out of the general fund. Two years, thank you. So uh, before um, we open up for some questions, um, I want to make sure that we uh, kind of wrap up what the rest of the process is, because the LCAP obviously doesn't end uh, tonight, nor does it actually end on the 14th. Um, so the next steps here are this, we held our public hearing today. Um, based on our discussions today and any other feedback um, prior to the posting of uh, the agenda for June 14th, we can make any edits or adjustments on our LCAP. Um, and then on the 14th, uh, board would, the board would take action on the LCAP and the budget. Um, we then send both the budget and the LCAP uh, to the county office for review. They have a programmatic and budget um, review process, and they always make small, slight adjustments or suggestions. Um, they make suggested wording to make sure that the intent of our actions and of the, of the wording we've used matches the statutory requirements. And then once we receive county uh, approval, we receive a formal approval from the county office and then we post this um, on our district website, and then the county is also uh, required to post our um, LCAP on their website. And that would then end this formal process of the LCAP. And then right when we start again, you know, really when the board has its retreat is really when the LCAP process begins again, because that's when we're reviewing progress towards goals and identifying other, you know, new priorities or highlighting priorities within the school district. Um, so this LCAP is a uh, iterative process and it kind of never ends. Um, but it does have a formal ending uh, in a week from today. So uh, I know that there were some board questions about some particular items. Um, I think it would be best you tell me, uh, President Hazleton, if you want those questions just to be asked, if, if anyone wants to ask questions. Um, and I can certainly address yeah, uh, any of those. We can ideas. open up to questions. Um, maybe if you have the questions that we asked prior to the meeting, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and um, it, I know you didn't have much time because I really just sent them before the meeting. Mm -hmm. But uh, about the, the TOSA positions, mm -hmm. um, uh, they're kind of related questions, okay. um, but um, just wondering kind of whether the, these positions and sort of the plan for these TOSA positions, you know, how are they shared and vetted with the um, elementary teachers uh, and principals um, and whether they believe that this is you know, this is the best because I, I definitely see that it's being responsive to their concerns mm -hmm. that were raised about uh, the additional support that's needed. So just sort of circling back mm -hmm. and, and making sure that this plan is what they also believe is the best way to uh, support them. Yeah. So the, you know, the loud and clear, we heard that we need more more support for the MTSS program and just more more time for the mm -hmm. people who are there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important that it, it, maybe it was assumed, but I'll, I'll say it that the the uh, teachers that we have in those positions of part-time positions are doing an excellent job. Mm -hmm. They're serving students, they're uh, communicating with parents, they're doing their best to communicate with teachers on a regular basis. We just don't have, uh, they're, they're hourly and they're, I believe it's 20 hours a week, which is a, a pretty insufficient um, compared to the full-time teacher uh, position. Mm -hmm. um, the, the principals themselves uh, participated in the creation of the job descriptions to make sure that we're being, that we're creating something that will serve the school sites. Mm -hmm. Um, based on their discussions with, you know, their sites, um, based on informal discussions we've had just throughout the year about how can we take this MTSS program and continue to develop it into a full, a full program. Um, and we're getting close and this will, this will probably be the biggest step I'd say we could take to, um, to fully building out our intervention or MTSS program. Okay, so in other words, 
these positions and this plan is supported by some of I can't be everybody, but the majority of uh, elementary teachers and uh, principals at the site. I, I would, would say, say that the support would be would be widely seen as a good move for the school sites. Um, in conjunction with, because I know a lot of what we hear from teachers is um, the intervention is important, but so is classroom support. Right. And so uh, we I, we didn't spend a lot of time about it, but in the in the LCAP, we are continuing the literacy and numeracy aids, mm -hmm. which are the in-classroom aids. So mm -hmm. um, I'm the teacher, you're my class, I teach a lesson, I can tell a couple of you need a little bit of extra support. And so the literacy and numeracy aids are that right in just in time support okay. for what we're learning in class. And then as, over time, I begin to see like some trends in your learning. And then the FastBridge data shows me, you know, that Dr. Davis has some gaps in his math learning. And so uh, we, we have a data meeting, we decide, you know what, he needs some extra help. And so then that moves into the tier two and tier three intervention program, mm -hmm. where he would be uh, serviced under the guise of the uh, learning support teacher and the intervention aides. So separating those two supports is really important. And neither of them on, the, on their own is, is a complete plan. So it's putting both of those things together in order to have okay. a complete support system. That helps because I think that was the missing piece for me was the in, in classroom. That I would say that's just as important to student learning as the intervention program. Okay, and then the second kind of related question, yes. and this was a question that came up in um, one or two of the office hours, is there, there seems to be a little bit of maybe uh, confusion around who the TOAST is report to and um, in, and kind of knowing exactly what their schedule is and what they're doing. So can you maybe explain for us how that works? Is I'm, I'm not really sure myself. Yeah, for sure. So these positions, and, and you know, ATOSA is, is a position that is doing something very different than a normal teaching position. And so we call it teacher on assignment because it really allows us to, to create a job description that keeps them on the teacher's salary schedule, um, but has a different set of job, job responsibilities. And so when we think of TOSA, we think of someone who's all going to a bunch of school sites and supporting particular programs, whether it's technology TOSA. In the past, we had an NGSS TOSA. Mm -hmm. This was right when I was coming in, we had a science TOSA. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a very specific area of support. Um, I think the term TOSA in this uh, position is a, maybe not, maybe it's not the right term. Maybe it's le just learning support teacher because they're going to be assigned to their school site. And so the learning support teacher at Brookside is supporting the students and teachers at Brookside. Um, they serve under the um, uh, supervision of the, of the site principal. Mm -hmm. um, and that's who they report to, just like every other teacher at that school site. Um, so it's a little bit different than many of the TOSA positions we're used to, where they're not, uh, they're not kind of um, responding and, and being more flexible. They have a very uh, defined role on the school site. Um, and again, like I said, they report directly to that principal. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Greenlinger. Yes, sir. So you must have gotten my um, my report cards from Hale Junior High because math was the issue for me. So I want to make sure you've been looking at my records. Um, I just wanted to say really quick, there's a really good question from Trustee Hardy. Um, I want to say really quick, you know, in our superintendent's office hours, there was a lot of um, really great suggestions and comments, you know, from teachers. And I want to give them credit for that. Um, in one of our office hours, uh, this type of thing came up. It, it wasn't specifically, you know, hey, TOSAs and things like that, but more help with intervention, more stu students need a lot of help. Um, learning loss is a real thing through COVID, you know, those types of things. And um, it, it was interesting because it kind of dif differed between the school sites. Some school sites, it was the primary grades. Some school sites, it was the upper grades. I mean, it just kind of differed between them. Um, there were other things that came up like roving AP and things like that. And those are really difficult to actually do um, because, you know, the one day the AP is at Red Oak that we got the problem at Oak Hills, you know, it's like that kind of a thing. So we did, we looked back, look at our core mission. We took the input that people were giving us and we thought, okay, what's the best thing we can do in that core mission. So I'm glad that Dr. Greenlinger, um, you know, he, he talked about that. I really appreciate that. Um, the other thing is with the MTSS that makes me really excited about this, um, these positions is the fact that when when districts start their program, it's always sort of like the district kind of creating this program and because it has to start somewhere. Right. And so, um, you know, a lot of oversight and a lot of pushing in and things like that. Now we're at the place where the MTSS program um, 
has to evolve. And the only way it's going to evolve is at each school site. And the only way the students are going to get the need, only way the students are going to get their needs met is by the intervention where it becomes very specific, becomes very targeted. Um, and there's two sides to that intervention pyramid. There's the academic and there's a the behavioral. And so one of the things we heard when we went around were the behaviors and that this was a very unique year where, you know, typically in Oak Park, we don't really see behaviors like we saw, you know, um, this past year. Um, on a side note, every superintendent in the county said the same thing. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's very typical, you know, coming out of a, a distance learning or a hybrid learning year. So moving forward, these, um, support TOSAs will also have a big part to play in our PBIS and our positive uh, behavior intervention uh, strategies program, um, you know, that we're rolling out through the district. So they'll be working not with just with academics, but with, you know, some of the things rolling out with PBIS with, you know, how to, how to work with students on behaviors, you know, having common language, you know, all these different things. Um, so I don't know if Dr. Greenler want to talk about that just a time yeah bit. and an important point that you made there dr davis is the is the ownership of the school site so um probably in every school district when a big program is begun it started at the district level it's established and then it really needs to like like a plant it needs to start growing roots at the school at where it's planted and it needs to become part of where where it's planted um and that that's the next step here the other piece that um dr davis talked about is um right now the principal is solely responsible for um, uh, overseeing SSTs and 504s, um, and then when students are struggling, they're 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 the only person there who can be supporting those families, contacting parents, and so the learning support teacher is going to be an important piece in that because there's a there's SST meetings uh, every month. So that's a day a month. There's 504 meetings probably a day a month, and so those are full days where the principal is leading a meeting and not visible on campus and not checking in with teachers. And, and so we also have to look at how are we supporting the greater program through, through this support. Um, and so the learning support teacher would be conducting the SST meetings. That's also makes sense because they're the ones who would be overseeing the intervention and support for students who are struggling. And so they're developing relationships with the teacher and the student and the parents over time as well. Um, and then it, it just becomes a more of a, um a system of support rather than a single um like a single step of support which is kind of what we have now and so um i just want to bring that up because i think uh the point of it becoming owning oh, the school site owning and taking ownership of the way intervention looks and the way um like the the details get enacted is really important and it shouldn't be anyone at the district office, you know, scheduling the intervention. That's kind of what we had this year because we were looking to establish and support. So we were doing a lot of the data analysis out of FastBridge. We were helping do a lot of the scheduling because the part-time teachers, if they did that, they would, their, all their time would be based doing that. And that's not what we want them to do. We want them to be focused on supporting students directly. Really good points. And then the last thing um, I wanted to mention is you know, tons and tons of research about early intervention, right? You know, when students first start school. And if we can provide that intervention at these young ages in these early grades, um, we know, um, we know for a fact that achievement will be higher as they move through the continuum of our, our school district, you know, through their learning. So um, this is another reason why we, we felt this was really, really important. Um, and we really believe the classroom teachers, you know, once this gets off and running, um, you know, a month or two into the school year, we really believe that our classroom teachers will see a big difference um, in uh, the gaps narrowing, um, the concept, the understanding of concepts growing, um, and, and even some, some basic things, right? You know, like reading and writing and spelling and all those basic things that kids are doing. Um, with, I mean, spelling when they're writing, you know, all those things that are happening um, will be improved and they'll see, they'll see little jumps in the students. And uh, so we think, you know, for the greater good, for, for the whole system of education that we have here in Oak Park, uh, we felt this was a, a really good move. And, and, and the last piece is, is a piece of data that's going to be in the ELO quarterly report, but that, that's not until, uh, until later this week. Um, 
But this year in our elementary schools, 945 intervention schedules were created. So uh, that some students went to intervention more than once, or maybe were in math and language art. So it's not 945 individual students. But if you can think that if every student received intervention 15 to 20 times per session, times 945, that's how much instruction, additional instruction is taking place. Um, and so being able to support all, all of that work um, is, is an important piece of, of us moving forward in MTSS. Any other questions for? I just had one question. So, I, you know, I, one thing that we heard at the listening session too is that some of the counselors are also being involved with the SSTs and the 504s. So would this then also shift some of that responsibility off of the elementary counselors so they could deal mostly with the SEL? Correct. So okay. um, again, there's, a, there's, a, there's X amount of work and X amount of people, and so the work gets spread. Um, the position in it, the position description says that they are scheduling, coordinating, and leading those meetings. Now, if it's a student whose the concern is is behavioral, then certainly the counselor would be there. Um, but it, it then allows the counselor to be the counselor and not the not involved in every SST. So that's an important point. Right. And so just to so I'm just saying this back to you. So this is different than TOSAs that we've had in the past, mm -hmm. in the sense that it is site directed. This position will be directed by the principal. We, we so, intentionally put that in the job description. So the mm -hmm. position then can be tailored according to the site needs and the principal has flexibility to direct that person. And it's that's natural because our stu our schools vary in enrollment by nearly 100 children from our smallest to our largest um, for elementary. And so the needs are going to be different. Right. Um, and the nuances to each campus are a little bit different. And so and so are the skills of our, our skills and interests and in, of our principals. And so it allows them to have a little bit more of a built out leadership team to support just whatever is happening at their campus. I think that's an important piece. Great, that sounds good. Um, so it's just different from the past where it was more kind of district office. Correct. So I think people hear the word TOSA, they might yeah. just you know mm -hmm. equate this. So it'd be really great if they could just message this. I'm sure it's already being done, um, but you know, the staff, they think TOSA, it's probably the well, only the, place. It's a great you know, program. The, the job description has not been approved yet. I've, but Once it's approved. Potentially later tonight, you we could decide to rename it to Learning Support Teacher instead of Learning Support TOSA, and then I think that just takes... Okay. Okay. I have one thing, too. I do think it would be important for the board is to get them together. Well, yeah, I'm glad uh, Mr. McGugan uh, just uh, suggested for those listening at home. Um, that the it's important for the three teachers to get together and, and discuss. So part of um, the role of the coordinator of instructional programs has been this year to hold those job alike meetings. Um, so meeting with the intervention teachers and then the intervention aides and making sure that the practices are um, aligned across campuses. And so I think that would be an important um, role to continue uh, when that uh, position uh, continues as well um, to make sure that it's uh, that we have we're balancing the unique needs of each campus with making sure that we're implementing this research-based intervention program. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Derek, do you have anything? I do not, thank you. Okay. Please, go yeah. ahead. I just, um, I had a question about yes. the, when you put the slide up about the, um, the new actions and expenditures. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of year one outcomes that are t TBD mm -hmm. um, and a couple that maybe declined. And the new actions seem to focus other than the college and career making that position a certificated position, but um, you know the supports for our secondary students, academic support. I know that that may mean that it doesn't mean that it's not happening, Mm -hmm. But I'm just wanting to know if there, when do we look at the ones that we don't have information about yet so that we can refine our actions or supports for those, they're predominantly um, for secondary students, attendance, A through G, mm -hmm. AP pass rates, um, biliteracy, seal, all, all of those. Yeah, that's, and that's an important ongoing discussion. Um, and there are a few items that remain in the LCAP for secondary, so like we have secondary, some secondary math support. Um, and so it might not be specific of exactly what is that going to be, because that when we talked about um, like lunchtime or before or after school uh, supports, that has to be something that's worked collaboratively with the school site and the teachers who are willing or able to provide that support. And so we can identify and say, okay, we're going to have a chunk of funding that we know is going to go towards secondary math support. 
Um, and then working together over time to develop, okay, what does that look like? Is that every Tuesday and Thursday, there's two teachers who have open office hours for 90 minutes and they'll tutor whoever needs to come in? Is it, um, is it bringing in outside math tutors? Um, so I think there has to be some direct action from the LCAP, but there also should be some remaining flexibility where we identify funding and set it aside and then work over time to, to identify what are those exact strategies gonna be. Because particular to the high school, which that, I think is what you're asking, yeah. um, we had seventh period sport, right. and we had something, we had a structure, right. and now we've lost that structure. Right. Um, my guess is it will take a few months for teachers to kind of feel out, okay, how am I using the additional 23 minutes in each period? What, what is it that kids would actually need to get, to get more support? Is it instructional aids coming into, uh, math classes? Is it after hour tutoring? It, I don't know what the answer is. And I, th I think we can't predict because this is a, such a brand new bell schedule for us. The rest of the world has had this bell schedule for ever, probably. And so we're, because we had a pretty progressive bell schedule uh, that has been changed, um, we're going to have some adjustment time. And I think what I found is that when, especially, you know, any of our schools, but at the high school, they take a studious approach to supporting students. And, you know, I think allowing Mr. McClenahan to let the bell schedule begin and then it kind of invoke that leadership process of, okay, what is it that we can do within this structure to support students? And then we've had funding set aside so we can say, hey, this is what we want to do. And we can say, okay, go ahead. The, um, the conversations that I've been privy to, I've been <clears throat> Mr. McClenahan invited me to two leadership meetings, and it's a lot what Dr. Greenlinger is saying, where um, they know they have certain supports already there that are continuing, that have been going on even beyond the seventh grade support. You know, there's certain things that are already happening. And to start the school year, those things are still in place. Um, what they wanted to do was do exactly that. They wanted to look and see what it looked like first, and um, you know, maybe take 30 days, maybe not even that long, and then regroup the group at the high school and you know look at it and decide okay wait a minute maybe we need to do the tuesday and thursday you know after school 90 minute you know writing lab math lab like whatever you want to call it you know homework club you know whatever um i've actually brought these ideas up to leadership team and you know they're thinking about it they're pondering um but they they really don't know you know it's one of those things where um we haven't lived it yet so we don't really know um, and I think that's actually a, a really good approach because there are still some things there that students can go to. And then when you take in the added 23 minutes per block, that's like an additional type of thing. In a way, it's different than the seventh period support, but it's actually a bit more specific and more targeted because it's, it's the subject the student is taking at the time. So um, it's a great question. It's a really good question, mm -hmm. but I think it's just something that's going to evolve. And um, I think after the first month or two, um, they'll they'll figure it out. There's there's some structures that I'm sure so, they can put. So in. just because it's not here mentioned in the LCAP, we do have funds or yeah. resources set aside to target our secondary um, yeah. needs. Yes, and um, another funding stream that has set aside funds for the, for not the direct uh, services of students, but the studying of the of this issue, like within the EEBG, we set aside a ton of funding um, for collaboration and alignment uh, uh, planning. Cool. And so, if we say to the teachers, you know, let's take two days for planning, and right, because that was another one of my questions mm -hmm. was there's the goal under staff well being and and we've talked so much this past year about the need for time and collaboration mm -hmm. and that isn't a new expenditure, but just because it's not there doesn't mean that we're not doing it. Correct. It lives in the EEBG and it's a significant portion of the EEBG is that uh, teacher collaboration time. Okay. And it's, it's also something that um, Mr. McGugan, um, last week, uh, last week, <laughs> last uh, board meeting in terms of sunshine item for negotiations. Right. I know that's something that um, that uh, is an interest of the district to uh, negotiate with the uh, with the teachers association. And and I have the same the same question for the goal on um, expanding goal three, expanding school safety and well being initiatives. There's been okay. So I can talk about that really quick. Um, 
I'm so glad you brought that up because I wanted to talk about that tonight. <laughs> so um, Mr. Benioff and I have been, and, and, another, and, a, and a whole group of people um, have been working really hard. And this did not just happen with the Uvalde, Texas tragedy. This was happening weeks and weeks prior to that. And um, we've been looking at reviewing all of our safety policies, protocols and practices and procedures. Um, and so we are taking a step forward. We, um, the board knows about this. Um, I'll make it public right now. <laughs> we are hiring a school safety consultant that is a retired commander from the Ventura County Sheriff's Department, um, Mr. Randy Pentis. Um, he is somebody that's completely tied in um, to all of these horrible tragedies that that happen, you know, he gets called to several of them. Um, he actually got called, um, he's been called to, to talk to, um, you know, school districts, churches, like all different kinds of places where these horrific things happen. He's been a responder, um, you know, to places, you know, after tragedies that have happened over the last 10, 15 years, uh, all over the United States. Um, he's an expert in school safety and security. Uh, we're gonna be bringing him on. He's going to start by doing a walkthrough of our sites with Mr. Benioff, myself, and um, a, a small group of people, and we'd love to have a board member or two with us when we walk through the sites. And then a comprehensive review of what I just said, all of our procedures, everything we do. Um, we're gonna have him look at the, the um, information we're receiving from these various vendors that um, we're bringing through here and through our committees, the Safety and Security, Taf safety and security Task Force. Um, he's gonna be a, become a, a part of our Safety and Security Task Force. Um, in term, you know, in that consultant role, um, that expert role, um, and I think it's it's so critical that we do this because the number one thing before te even before teaching and learning is the safety of our students and our employees. So there's nothing more important. So um, very excited that uh, retired Commander Pentis has agreed to come on board with us here at the Oak Park Unified School District, um, and um, you know he was a. He was a vital cog in the Ventura County Sheriff's Department for years and years and years. So we're very excited to have him on board. So yeah, that is something we are definitely moving when, forward. When is that kicking off, Dr. Ennis? Uh, Mr. Pentis, uh, retired Commander Pentis, is meeting with me Monday morning um, to have an introductory meeting. And then on the 28th of June, um, we'll be doing those walkthroughs um, at the school sites. Um, and then the last question I had is a little ticky tacky question, but um, the, you said that you're taking okay. some of the challenge success um, mm -hmm. money and putting it back or giving it back, if you will, to the PFAs. And mm -hmm. it, are the PFAs on board with that? I know they need to vote with their associations and stuff, but are, are we good with Yes, that? I spoke with the PFA, uh, at the high school, the PFA president and treasurer uh, a few weeks ago. Um, arriving at the number to make sure that it is accurately reflected. And they're okay here. with it because mm -hmm. I know their donations have been down mm -hmm. overall, not the high in, school. In my discussions, that, that's one of the programs that they're most proud of supporting because okay. it's so integral to okay. just who we are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Not ticky tacky at all. Any other questions, comments, Tina? No? All right. Thanks, Jay. All right. We're going to move on to, to uh, B1B. Public hearing and board review proposed 2022-2023 Oak Park Unified School District annual budget. So we're going to open this public hearing at 6.53 p.m. Do we have any public comments? Okay, so I'm going to close this public hearing at 6.54 p.m. And hand it off to... Good evening, good evening, good evening. Uh, as uh, President Hazelton said, my name is Adam Rauch, and it's my honor to say that I'm the chief business uh, official in uh, Oak Park Unified School District, um, and more importantly, your tour guide tonight through our uh, proposed budget. Before I get started, I want to uh, thank uh, my partner in crime up there, Mr. Byron Jones. If I was a uh, a seafaring individual like our former superintendent, Dr. Knight, and I had my own sailboat, I would name it something like uh, maybe uh, Sir Byron along those lines um, because he has been strong, steady, and true. Um, and we've faced our fair storms together, and I think uh, 
uh, we, we've managed them well, and that has a lot to do with him being strong, steady, and true. So thank you, Byron Jones. But he's not just here for me to compliment him. He's also here to uh, keep me honest. So if you have questions, he'll be our fact checker. Um, and also, before I want to get started, I want to thank uh, Rogni here for a couple hours ago um, giving me uh, some critiques on my presentations, telling me that I say you know a lot, and that's the, my little tick, it's my um. So I'm very self-conscious about it right now. I have it written on every page, no, you know. Uh, so I, I would hope that you would all help me uh, stay accountable to that because I have a goal of eliminating that here tonight. So thank you, Rob. You know we will, Adam, you know we will. <laughs> Okay, so with that, let's let's jump into this. Um, Ragini is also going to be uh, my clicker, so thank you for that. Uh, we we hear this is uh, what we're doing tonight is part of Ed, Ed Code, and I believe uh, Dr. Greenlegger spoke about that. That prior to our uh, adopting our our board operating budget, uh, we do need to uh, have a public hearing, and that's what we're doing here tonight. Um, this is my tried and true uh, budgets reporting cycle. Right now we're here in June as part of it. Every time that we're gonna adopt the budget, we're also gonna speak LCAP. The LCAP has to be adopted prior to the adopting of our budget, which is why you know tonight in this uh, study session, Dr. Greenling was up here prior to me because a week from now you'll be hearing Dr. Greenlinger up here, and you'll have an opportunity to approve, uh, to approve the LCAP, and then I'll come up here shortly thereafter to where you'll have an opportunity to ab approve the budget. And then um, right now our budget is, you know, we are going to adopt our budget two weeks or, you know, a week, well, actually really close depending on when the, when the governor officially announces his budget, but nonetheless we will be adopting it prior to. So you can imagine that, um, as we speak about, everything we're speaking about is projections tonight, all 100% of it. In the moment, you know, when I talk about MYP tonight, it's going to be a snapshot in time, things we know today. Well, the moment the governor adopts his budget, everything changes. Um, and uh, our assumptions will obviously change. And then obviously the moment that July 1 hits and our budget becomes enacted and we start operating under it um, and things aren't just 100% projections, they're now projections with actuals things will change as as we go um and so that's what we're we're here at the uh at the budget process which will be enacted as of uh july 1. so moving on um the governor in may had the may revise and he you you know we have revenues have continually outpaced anything that um any uh, financial guru uh, whatever have projected and uh, therefore um, as a result the governor uh, has created a quite you know it's a it's a robust budget um, you know with a lot of money prop prop 98 money which is what we're funded on coming into us but it's still at this point it is a project you know it is um, it is a proposal just like tonight I'm proposing a budget um, it is a proposal and now the uh, legislature, the assembly and Senate, they're, they're jockeying with what they want. And so that's why we know by the time uh, the governor ado adopts his budget, things will be different than, uh, than the May revise. But nonetheless, um, we have to uh, go with the information that we know with today, and that's the May revise. So what is in um, uh, our budget? Uh, when I, I don't just pick and choose when I see the governor's uh, May revise, I don't pick and choose the things that I think that'll be helpful for our budget. Um, I, I, I stay true to school services of California, their dartboard. They sort of tell us the things, the assumptions that we should be uh, applying to our budget, as well as I look to our county office of education. They put out a common mes message as well as saying, hey, these are the things that you should have versus the things that you shouldn't have, because a lot of the stuff in, in the governor's budget is without trailer build language. We don't know what it, what it really looks like or how the funds will impact us uh, at the school district level. Um, so we will have, um, we are planning on a 656 COLA. Um, which for us is equal to about a $2.1 million increase in ongoing revenue. And since that, which I'll show in a slide later on um, of how that's applied to the base, that is an increase to our base. So that is considered ongoing in perpetuity. Uh, instead of just giving like a mega COLA this year, the, the governor has proposed doing this 
what he's calling a, a you know two point one billion dollar investment into the LCFF, and um, that equates to us uh, about one point two million dollars in additional revenue, um, which is also to the base. So that is in perpetuity, um, knowing that our funding isn't just uh, we're not constantly funded. We have factors, so our doesn't mean that you know we're guaranteed the same amount every year because we do uh do our revenue based off of our ada which fluctuates which we could talk about later and then the, the third thing that's included in here is uh, we knew that coming into next year that we were faced with uh a couple of of um expirations one was the uh, hold harmless ada and then the second uh being the buy down on pers and stirs and so um this one everyone feels solid about because the partner of finance is backing it. Um, sort of uh, Mike Fine of FICMAT, uh, he sort of uh, uh, was the brainchild behind this plan. So they think this one is, is pretty gold, which is why school services is backing it. And that's instead of us being funded on current or prior year for our ADA, this is that we can use um, one of two. Our, current year, AD, the, the greater of our current year um, or our three prior years of ADA. And that's, that's sort of the help with the cliff that uh, the hold harmless ADA um, has created. So that uh, we are using our, the three year uh, prior ADA average, and that has resulted in an increase. Well, this is slightly misleading because we are decreasing, which I'll cover later, decreased in our ADA from uh, current year to next year. However, it's still, it's an increase of 137 versus if we actually had that experience, that cliff that we thought we might have. So it is an increase from what we thought we were gonna have, but still a decrease in ADA from this year. Um, and then the other one that, the, that goes along with this, because the governor, everybody said, well, that's, that's not enough because our, our, our attendance yield, which is your attendance rate, because we're not funded on enrollment, we're funded on our ADA, and that's your average daily attendance. That's what is your attendance rate? How often do your kids come to school, which is a percentage multiplied by your enrollment? And so the problem is a lot of school districts' uh, attendance has really uh, tanked this year, you know, where they might be, you know, uh, average district, maybe about 94, 95%, they're experiencing maybe even in the high 80s. So you can imagine they've been hit really hard. So the, the governor is proposing as well to say, hey, which this one is actually getting a lot of kickback um, from the legislature, both the uh, assembly and Senate. They don't like this one. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm happy they don't um, because uh, this one doesn't help us. Because if we were to take current or prior year ADA and get the relief. So they're saying, hey, uh, you can use your, um, the proposal is you can use your, AD, your ADA, your attendance yield. What was your attendance rate in 2019-20 and apply it to the three-year rolling average? Well, that can be massive for some districts and pour a lot of money into those districts. Well, we happened to this past year, um, our, our attendance rate was 96.73, which was actually an increase in our attendance rate. We actually had the opposite. Our attendance rate went up. So that would bring in zero extra dollars for us. Um, so I'm actually happy that that one's getting uh, pushed back by, uh, by the legislature and, 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 and hope that that one doesn't stick. So that means that there's, uh, you know, I think they said that that would be about you know, $2 billion in, in revenue relief to those districts. So that means that that would come be spread out in some other way, shape or form. Uh, next slide, please. So what's not included? Um, and there's a lot of other things. I kind of just sort of included what's not included of things that we would, would tangibly budget right now. Um, and the first one is $8 billion in one-time discretionary funds. Uh, which is estimated about fifteen hundred dollars uh, per ADA. Uh, trailer bill hasn't, uh, you know, trailer bill language hasn't been written for this, so we're not necessarily sure of, you know, what strings attached would come with it. But right now, uh, that looks, if this were the were the case, this would be six million two hundred fifty thousand seven hundred seventy dollars of increased one-time revenue. That would not be um, ongoing. Um, additionally, uh, Adam, for, Adam, yes, are you saying? That could happen. Um, I, I something like that is going to. There's more than likely this one. So will, we could get another six point three million of one million dollars of one time dollars. 
okay, discretionary. And there's been some talks of, I think a lot of it will be, when you say one time, what, what does that mean? Because I, I, bottom line is we didn't see a buy, we, we didn't see a continued buy down on PERS and STRS. And so, you know, um, I think the way the governor is sort of handling this saying, hey, we're pumping you more money um, and you can take care of your increases you know, to PERS and STRS with that additional dollars as opposed to him, you know, just throwing one-time investment towards, um, towards decreasing those, uh, by continuing the buy-down. Uh, another, another is uh, the $4.8 billion in ongoing for Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, um, which would be uh, uh, $2,500 per student K-6. This is a K-6 program. Uh, then you know, $2,500 per ADA uh, multiplied by your unduplicated percentage. So this would be estimated about $628,000 for us. And this is um, expanded learning opp opportunity program is for um, uh, before school, after school, uh, summer school intercession type of uh, opportunities for students to um, sort of uh, have an opportunity to increase their amount of time uh, under the care of, of the school district. And then also, as well as um, we knew that the special education did get a 6.56 COLA adjustment, um, but there uh, is potentially additional uh, revenue coming in state funding for our special ed program. And so the, a lot of it's we know that we know that when the governor adopts his budget that there will be additional revenue coming in that things will, um, you know, uh, improve from based on what we will be uh, looking at for our adopted budget. Uh, that being said, uh, we're not counting on it until we actually see the governor's budget proposal. And at that point, we'll make our adjustments. Moving on. How am I doing? I, I don't think I've said you, uh, you know to no, Thank you. Uh, did I? Oh, really? Are you keeping it? All right. Darn it. I thought I was doing good. Darn it. Now, I, now you beat me down. You beat me down. You're supposed to give me positive. And then at the end. All right. Uh, so. LCFF funding factor, factors. Um, I sort of spoke about it. Like, you know, I, it's funny is I haven't really shown this slide before, um, and this is sort of a breakdown of, of how we are funded um, based on our base grant per ADA. So um, every single student generates. I've talked about it, just haven't showed it. Every single student uh, generates a base grant, and that base grant is based on what what grade you're in. Um, and when I say student, I mean one ADA. So a student times our attendance uh, factor, our attendance yield. And so each one ADA generates uh, a base grant, uh, with, but depending on what grade level they're in. And then when we receive a COLA, you just simple, this is pretty simple mathematics. You multiply the COLA times whatever the current base is, and then you're gonna add that to the base. Well, this year we have something in addition is that's that additional LCFF investment of $2.1 billion. And so that's been factored as you could see. So you could see across what our current base grant is this year, what the addition of a 656 COLA is, what the addition of a $2.1 billion investment is. And then that, and then based on that, you multiply a percentage that gives grade span adjustments. They, the, State gives us extra money for K-3, which is meant for, uh, I believe, smaller class sizes. And then uh, they give for 9-12 with the intent that that would be CTE. You add those up, and that gives your adjusted base grant per ADA for the year. And you take your ADA within your grade spans, and you multiply it by that. And then for every student that is unduplicated, like Dr. and I, I wrote it down because I need to get that out of my vernacular, uh, our multilingual students. Um, low socioeconomic and our foster youth, um, you multiply 20% of the base grant, which is across. So for every one of those students, you get that additional uh, supplemental dollars for, uh, for our uh, revenue. And uh, so that then you look at, you could look at, that's essentially how our base grant is funded for this coming up year, calculated for this year. And then uh, we look at our ADA, and this sort of gives an illustration of what I was talking about instead of what we thought we were going to be funded at. We thought we'd be funded at in one of those line, X'd out lines. We thought we'd be funded at 4167, which was our calculated ADA for last year. 
and you can see that in the blue line and for 21-22, we thought we'd be funded based off of our P2ADA. Um, instead, it's our prior three years uh, with a little caveat for uh, next year because in 20, 2021, we didn't calculate our ADA. And so we actually used the hold harmless twice um, for a three-year average along with last year's ADA. So you could still see based on our projections that well, we could talk about at some point, the um, probably when we get to the MI multi-year projection that we are still projecting because once you start taking that hold harmless out of your three-year average, you can expect that your average is going to drop. And so next year we are showing a decrease. We are still considered to be in declining enrollment. So while we do have a 68.69 decrease in ADA from last year, um, it's a lot better than having that 68.69 plus that 137.37. That would have been even worse. So thank you. On to the next slide. So all that then equates to what our revenue is. And this here- Adam, yes. going back to the enrollment. Yeah. So I'm sure that agrees to what Stu presented last last month. Uh, I, I do different I do different projections oh, right. than Stu. Okay, so, me and Stu do different ones. Okay. Because you really, Stu's got to worry about, um, he worries about uh, what, what do you do with enrollment? Enrollment you use to calculate how you staff. That's what enrollment's really impor important for. So if 100% of our, if we're a, a district of 4,300 kids and 100% of our kids came to school on a day that we had enough staff to make sure that there's one teacher in a class, you know, those types of things. That's where enrollment comes in. But I do, I do project a, a slightly different. I use it based off of a calculation of, of about a 15 year historical uh, cohort regression where I look at percentage of prior year of how our kids, you know, what percentage of them stay in a cohort. So how what's the percentage of our second graders that become third? It's a percentage and I have a running tally. So that's my question. Why is it flat? From next year to the following year. So 4277 to 42. Hold on, let me so, let me go to that page as well. Um, it's the out, it's the not this year's budget. But you're the, talking enrollment the no but if you look at so for this one 427 to 42 because the the thing about it is where where a cohort regression can get you is depending on what what are you replacing your senior year your 12th graders with in, in your K and we've leveled out this last year coming into this year our 12th graders was a bigger was a bigger class than what we are projecting over time of historically what our kindergartners are coming in now that might change a little bit as we expand our tk program but nonetheless um, we're, we're graduating a bigger uh, senior class this year knowing that the 12th graders it's not going to be a big drop from the 12th graders next year to the incoming uh, TKs. That, and that's where my, my cohort regression comes in. And sometimes, I, if you want, I can share that with you. It's a, it's a fun file. Okay, we good there? Okay, so unrestricted uh, revenue. Um, and so we're looking at a, a comparison between estimated actuals. Remember, we, we had second interim, um, the last time that you, uh, uh, approved an operating budget was at second interim. That's our expenditures from July 1 to January 31st that we presented in March. Um, but now we're looking at our estimated actuals. I've said this in the past, some districts will just use their second interim as their estimated actuals. Um, we actually, we try our best to um, take a look at POs, closing POs that we can, what expenditures that we think aren't gonna happen and take those off the books um, and make our adjustments down as best as we can, knowing that it's not going to be uh, completely accurate until we close the books um, officially in August. So, but here, nonetheless, you could see the difference um, between what what all those things, just those really those three uh, assumption changes that the governor that I, that's what's in the uh, budget, what kind of impact they have, and it is significant because that's three point four six million dollars. You see the difference between the two um, with the estimated actuals. Um, and when you then take a look at it compared to the two years, yeah, I said 3.46 million. Um, they had anticipated, uh, you know, when, when school services looked at the $2.1 billion increased investment plus the 656, they, they calculated it to be about, you know, a 10 plus percent COLA. Um, but 
it really for us it's we're not funded in percentages we're funded i say we're funded in in actual dollars and which if you just do the simple calculation of that 3.4 million dollars it actually equates to an 8.47 increase in lcf revenue and the main reason for that is because of the declining enrollment you have the factor for your um, revenue is decreasing so therefore you don't just get the straight cola percentages um, we also have seen an increase in our supplemental i think it's important to know because this lcfs supplemental it sounds like a, a, a categorical or it sounds like a restricted dollar, but it's not. It comes in your LCFF. When you see that $44 million for 11, that includes all of your uh, supplemental dollars as well. So we receive about $1.3 million. Our $1.3 million of supplemental is part of that $44 million. And I think that's important to know because that, that while it does come in our unrestricted, it doesn't, it comes with the expectation that you're going to improve the services of the students who are generating those funds. And so for us this year, um, we have been seeing an increase the last two years. We're getting about a little over $200,000 increase this year. And that's been a large part because of the Summer Seamless Program, the Universal Meals for All. Um, we've actually been able to use our alternative income form instead of the national school lunch free and reduced lunch application. And that's the traditionally been the application that's determined low socioeconomic students. In the alternative income form, it's a very, it asks pretty much two questions. How many people in your household and, and what's the you know, gross income? And so it's, it's a pretty easy uh, survey to do. Well, as a result, we've seen a drastic increase in our qualifying students the last two years. Um, I wanna give a slight caveat and um, you know, little a warning is that that's going away next year in terms of the alternative income form. We are gonna be uh, required to go back to the NSLP to determine that. So you know, it's gonna be um, up to us to, to try to find ways because we have struggled in the past to get um, families to complete the NSLP ap application. But you can see, at least the good thing is, is we can put a tangible you know, finger on how much money we have increased the last couple of years as a result of, of participation. Um, and then I'm also happy to know that, you know, with the LCAP that um, Dr. Greenlinger, you know, um, I would like to think that every district would be doing as we did is looking at that additional revenue and saying, hey, how can we actually improve the services of the students who are getting it versus trying to say, hey, how can we offset some current expenditures that we have, uh, tag it as new supplemental, so it really just relieves the general fund of funding. So I, I commend us, and I like to think that all districts do that. Um, and then, uh, you know, with the LCFF, it, as always, that's our lion's share. It's 98% of our unrestricted revenue, um, and that makes up our unrestricted dollars. Um, restricted revenue. This, now, this you know saw quite the opposite. You know, we saw this massive increase on uh, the unrestricted side, but a massive decrease on the restricted side. And I think, you know, we don't have to think too hard. Think of how much, how many plans have we adopted? Uh, you know, the last you know year, two years, all that was restricted dollars coming in, and so we've seen a drastic decrease on our restricted side of the of the house, and. Um, that comes in the form of, you know, the ESSER decrease that we have for federal, and then also that big one, the $3.2 million in state revenue. You could see straight down the line between the E-Log, the EEBG, the spe uh, special education, in-person instruction grant, and the expanded learning opportunities program. Um, the drastic decrease, it doesn't mean all that money has been spent, we'll cover that later on in a different slide, but it, you, it does mean the revenue, you don't, even if you have that as a carryover amount, you only receive the revenue in one year, so therefore you're going to see uh, a sharp decrease in revenue, even though you might have some of that money left, that's just would ultimately be sitting in the ending balance. And then the last one is uh, in our other local revenue. Uh, this we can always, this always starts lower because we, we budget our parent revenue, our donations that come in um, as we receive them. Rarely do we forecast that. And when we do forecast it, we do um, budget it with a one-to-one -one expenditure with it. Uh, but we can anticipate over time, over the next year, that that other local revenue will increase. Any questions about revenue? And the next slide is essentially the combined. Um, so, so go ahead. On 
on the items that you said in your previous slide were the uh, governors may revise what's not included. Of those three bullets that were in that slide, like the 8 billion one time discretionary and the 4.8 ongoing for um, yeah. ELO, where would that hit? Would that hit? Well, good, or? well, good question. I mean, good because when when the when the governor comes out or when we get a, a, a an apportionment a notice uh, from the CDE or actually you know from it goes to the CDE to the state or to our VCOE and to the VCO to us, it actually gives us what the resources are resource number and based on what that resource number is, we'll determine if it's going to be restricted or unrestricted. I'm going to assume that the expanded learning opportunities program will be on the restricted side of the house, but I have to imagine when I see one time discretionary funds that it will come in on an unrestricted um, and would it would impact the uh, the first set the unrestricted revenue that we have that would be uh, flooding in there as you can imagine as one big chunk of money that depending once again we don't know what the trailer bill language is going to say hey you need to expense this over three years you get five years you can expense it you can uh, use it on uh, you know things you can't use it on people you can use it on people you can't use it on the so those are all the things that we still have to wait and see from the governor and then on the um the number at the bottom of the restricted revenue slide that talks about um decrease in the parent organization donations is that just just a flat decrease in donations or does that also reflect one once again um, we we budget that as actual that comes in so for okay. instance so say this year um we receive well um Estimated actuals, actually, we, I have it here for estimated actuals for the revenue. Um, restricted, we received and other local revenue $4.7 million of whatever that portion is, that is the parent uh, funded, the parent donations, the parent, P, actually both PFA and fees collected from, for like say field trips and those types of things. Mm -hmm. We budget that as a zero. Oh, I see. Okay, knowing that throughout the year. So when I come back at first interim, mm -hmm. um, or if we decide even to say we do a 45 day revise, which we could depending on what the governor's budget comes in. Um, when I come back to, at first interim, that number is going to increase. It's going to be a bigger number. And because those, uh, because the, the donations have been budgeted as we receive and budgeted as actuals, but then so will the expenditure as well. Will be as so a they're always budgeted as zero, and then they get yeah. Added and part of the and the other part of the reason with that is remember when you any if we increase without knowing what it is, and when we increase our expenditures, mm -hmm. um, knowing that our three percent of our uh, uh, routine restricted maintenance are eighty one fifty, that three percent increases as well as our three percent reserve amount increases because once you increase your expenditures, so you're actually inflating your expenditures when you don't need to at that point. Hey, Adam. So I, in the same vein as what Sway was saying, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So I'm looking at our combined revenues. And so we have estimated actuals around 52 million and our proposed budget for 22-23 is 51.7. So we're actually lower on the revenue side Correct. at the end of the day yeah. by 304,000 because even though we've had these augmentations in the first three yeah. bullets that you've had it's also offsetting those one-time funds that we got in previous years is that correct absolutely so we're and still at a negative we're at a net negative i mean really it's probably a wash when you come to the parent revenue that will sure. that different it, that but so, we're, we're about to what you're about to see is because that's the real challenge that we've we've been faced with that we'll see on the next slide perfect transition ragani to the next slide as what we've seen is is our challenge then is is these programs come in we get all this money for to do these programs and it says well hey do you want to continue the programs do we have that need that continues and then at that point do we say hey are we going to use now instead of being restricted dollars one-time funds to use ongoing and saying hey now we have an increase in our unrestricted side of the house are we going to use those funds to continue those because there's something that we feel is valuable and that we need and that we need and therefore um, when we look at our under, unrestricted expenditures, you can start seeing, well, what's, man, that's, we've increased our unrestricted expenditures by $3.5 million. And so um, let's break it down. Let's see what, 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 what's, you know, what's making up that $3.5 million. And so when we look at it, we start with certificated salaries, um, our 1,000s. And 
those are the things that we spoke about because the learning support TOSAs, there's three of them, and, and this is just the salary portion of them, that's $270,000. Um, and this is where a perfect example where you say, hey, well, I thought you said that that was supplemental. Well, supplemental is your unrestricted dollars. Um, and so a portion of those is paid for by our supplemental dollars. That's where we are increasing the services of the students um, uh, who are generating those funds. So a portion of that's coming out of the supplemental portion of the unrestricted and a portion is coming out of um, non-supplemental or is tagged as not being supplemental. Then we have step in your natural step in column. We have a college and career counselor that we've added. We've added a wellness counselor. And we know that we've applied for um, funding for say the wellness counselor to where we know that this might come off the books, depending if that grant money comes in and that would be reflected there, but also knowing that, but this does give us an idea of what is our, what is our core program here um, that our unrestricted uh, m revenues coming in should be contributing to that when we do have an opportunity, it's always nice when we do say, hey, we can use one-time dollars to supplant, but also in the event that those one-time dollars were there, do we wanna make sure that our unrestricted dollars are, are leading those programs? And so um, I'd have to imagine even if we were to get a grant for these wellness, for the wellness counselor that say it's a three-year grant that on year four, it's a, something we would want to continue with the district and it would be something that need to come out of the general fund. So nonetheless, as of right now, it's in there as a general fund. Um, we have uh, increased our subs and hourly and this is, you know, I'll be completely honest, this one might be a, a, a tad bit um, overestimated but I'm not willing to take that gamble yet. Um, we've, we've just started tracking our OT and our hourly. It's something that hadn't been done in the past. Um, and so because of some of the, those OT and hourly were uh, tagged to the restricted side of the house, um, I wanna see what the impact is gonna be on the unrestricted side. So which we've seen an increase for our subs next year. Is this, um, the, is this the result of the adjustment we made? The hourly, no. Oh, well, be, well, no, it's not the not the uh, hourly for the adjustment for hourly. Um, well, there's something actually. Yes, well, it could be in part to that, and that's part of it. Like saying, hey, let's see how what that impact is. You're right that the uh, uh, teacher uh, non-instructional and instructional hourly rate that will have an impact. So what? So what exactly is the 163? Because that's a big number. What is that again? So that's subs, subs. increase in subs increase. because we've increased our rate. Um, so an increase of subs and an increase in hourly, uh, planned hourly and overtime uh, expenditures. Why are the subs increasing? We, we've increased 150 as, from 150. Uh, the 100, the, permanently, we've now instituted 150 versus the one, 125. The rate. The yeah, the okay, that's what I was asking. Yeah. It's, it's a result yes. of the rate. The, the rate, yes. Okay. There you go. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And a result of their instructional and non-instructional rate that we didn't have before. So in the past, when a teacher would cover another class, it was a flat $25. Now they get the instructional rate, which is $50, $58. So that we've seen increases there. That was part of the, the collective bargaining. And then uh, we have an assistant superintendent uh, that was announced tonight. Congratulations to Tammy Herzog. Um, and there's a slight difference between the current director uh, rate and the assistant soup at 31,000, um, which add up, it gets you around that $3.5 million range. Uh, salaries and benefits make up on the unrestricted side about 91%. That stays about consistent from what we've been experiencing in the past. Moving on to our 2000s, which is our classified salaries. We've seen in increases. Um, this was another one. We increased our campus supervisors this past year um, and had that tagged to our expanded learning opportunities grant. And we've elected to say we um, still need those increased campus supervisor. Uh, presence on campus and therefore have transitioned them from the uh, e-log to the general fund. Our innovation lab specialist, the three technology uh, teachers at the elementary school, three of those, uh, natural step in column. Uh, we've moved three math IA1s from the e-log over, four 
uh, increased our DK instructional aids by four. Uh, budgeted hourly and overtime increase to 35. And then our RBT uh, behavioral therapists at 30, roughly $30,000. Those are our increases to our classifieds. Moving on to benefits. This is where we see um, a, if you look at our increase in, in benefits, it's not in proportion to what you see the increase in your classified and certificated because remember we had the ex, uh, expiration of the buy down of the PERS and STRS rate. So we knew if we didn't increase our expenditures by $1, if this is flat line from last year to this year, we'd still see a massive increase in our PERS and STRS. Uh, but then when you also increase your staffing on top of it, um, you're gonna see an increase uh, beyond the expiration of the um, uh, buy down. So our STRS increase is about 638, 39,000 and our PERS increase is about 300,000. And then um, our health and welfare, our, our insurance has increased and those are mainly due, we've seen obviously as some of our, we have experienced about a 5% increase in our uh, plans. Uh, but remember that we do cap our plans, that we have a, a, a cap, an em, employer, con, employer contribution cap, meaning that when those plans meet or exceed the cap, that the employee picks up the difference beyond the cap. So we have seen some increases to get closer to our cap max, but also because of the new positions that we're hiring that are uh, health and welfare eligible, we are seeing a drastic increase in our health and welfare by about $400,000 in insurance. And then um, so books our, and- our, So our rate is about 40%. Tip, I'm just doing rough math. Benefits, 10.7 million. We really, to be honest, we had about $60,000 left that of prior to the new employees coming in. We had about $60,000 left of cap. Yeah. for the dis district before we were going to just max out on every we we only have two plans that are currently under the cap so just about everything is almost to the cap or exceeding it so pretty soon it'll be pretty easy to pr project our our health and welfare because it'll just be your cap i was just doing a high level i was taking the total benefits of 11 or 10.7 divided by the the salaries mm -hmm. certificated and classified it's about 40 percent of the is that yeah. typical of a school to, okay yeah wow okay okay then moving on to books and supplies our four thousands we've seen increases uh of about 340 the vast majority of this was um we did make a shift in our lottery uh this year this was a uh, strategical shift from using I'm on, um, I'm still on that last one. It's just underneath it, Ragini. It's a, it was hidden. It was hidden there. I apologize for that. Can you explain to the public what lottery means and how that? Yeah, we get, we get two, budget? we get two, and I, I didn't bring my school services um, dartboard, but we get two forms of lottery revenue. Believe it or not, the lottery does give us money, uh, California lottery. And we get one form in restricted dollars. Uh, that's to what we use for textbooks. And then we get another form for unrestricted dollars. And the tag for that is it has to be used on instruction. Our unrestricted, it comes in the resource 1100. And so um, to give a little bit of history, maybe too much information, and I apologize if, for that, um, is that uh, we, when we sort of had our budget crunch, when I came in 2019-20, we were faced with about a million dollar decrease in revenue that year from what we had projected uh, projected at the budget adoption, and so it immediately became that okay, what can we what can we slash? What can we uh, try to recoup? And one of the things that we had done um, then and moving forward had done up until this point is we took our lottery funds, um, our unrestricted, and did whatever we had there at that year is whatever I had left, whatever I can unbudget, and just did a negative write-off to teacher salaries. It's easy. It's, it's a clean, single transaction, 
and it's meeting the purpose of the dollar in terms of you can. It's not to the letter because it's is instruction. But what does that do? It takes these un, it takes that unrestricted lottery and reduces the uh, zero 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 recess your LCFF dollars from having to pay for teacher salary. So I just did a straight write off. And so now with this increased revenue coming in, the way I see it is it's partly restoring some of the um, programs that we had prior to those cuts of 2019-20. And, and one was this is how we decided to fund our current and future technology needs and getting those devices out of the um, uh, Measure S and using lottery funds because it can be used to purchase technology devices. So we're using lottery funds to pay for the one-to-one -one program. However, this year, it's not a straight, we had told Enoch that his uh, technology budget was about 600. However, this year for the Chromebooks, which you'll see, I believe they're coming in uh, next Tuesday, that they are split funded next year because we are, as we had said, uh, prior to that the Chromebooks would be funded partly out of the whatever's left with ESSER 3 at the end of this year, whatever that balance was. And then we still relieve some revenue from our um, uh, parent partic the participation program. So we're taking that revenue from the parent participation plus ESSER, and then whatever's left over, that balance will go to lottery. And that's why when we get to our ending fund balance, we'll see that our lottery actually carries uh, a fund balance that we assign at the end of our um, budget because we're not expensing, because we get about $750,000 in lottery. And so you can imagine uh, $750,000 a year in lottery, um, we're gonna have a whole lot of textbooks adoptions coming down the, the, the pike here. And so the unbudgeted side that's from, that's not for technology will be used to purchase our uh, text, you know, uh, will go towards uh, textbook adoptions as well. So just to add on to Drew's point, I, I think sometimes people think the lottery money, we're getting a ton of money for public education, yeah. but it's really a tiny sliver. It's about like one and a half percent. So yeah, we get 700, 750,000 in unrestricted, by. Byron. This is your time to shine here. This is your time it's to shine. Less than how, $200 per student. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How much, what's our restricted lottery amount? Our 60, 65. And what does that equate to in, in dollars for us on the restricted side? $200,000, $300,000, and that's really what we've used to be our, our, our pure uh, sole source for our textbook adoptions. And so um, I think this puts us in position to um, you know, try to be sustainable with the resources that you have to meet the needs for your district down the road saying, hey, it, you know, we now have a way to fund technology outside of a bond measure. We now have a way to fund our textbooks outside of hoping that we get one-time dollars this year, that we now have a way to, to keep ourselves stable. Um, and so I think that I'm, I'm really, to be honest, I'm really excited about that portion. Um, and then, uh, however, it, it, we are using some lottery funds to hold aside for, in the past we've used uh, measure, uh, bond dollars to purchase copy machines. We're in the process right now to look at what, what's in our best interest to either um, lease or purchase um, copy machines because we have about six that need to be replaced uh, for next year. We have a little uh, spot and lottery funds for this year to to, to look at covering those costs. Um, moving on, unrestricted for services and operating expenditures. We did see an increase in our property insurance this year of about $100,000. And then you could imagine as our, you know, there's a reason for a COLA. A COLA is for your increased cost that um, also on our DART board that school services gives our CPI, consumer price index is 6.11%. Um, that's not a number I create. I go off of what school services says, and that goes towards we increase. Um, a lot of times we don't look at our, um, even though we, sh we should, but we don't want to inflate too much. We may really look at our services and operating expenditures of, of hitting that 6.11%. And so that was really the addition there. For the property insurance, is that something we anticipated and anticipate will continue to so in other words, is this sort of following the trends of what homeowners are seeing due to in our area? I, I, I'm, I would, it would only be a guess and I would need to get our JPA here to tell us, you know, because we do that's that is through the county to say if this is a, a growing uh, trend that we uh, believe that we're going to see. Um, but I have to imagine that it's somewhere along this, the same vein. Okay, moving on. 
Um, the next one is uh, looking at our restricted expenditures. And this one here is uh, showing ultimately if we've seen a dra drastic decrease in our restricted as a result, you could imagine you have $3 million less in restricted revenue. You're gonna now see a decrease in your restricted expenditures, knowing still that you have some carryover funds. So this is, this is a perfect example of probably when we get to the ending balance, we're gonna see that the restricted side of the house is deficit spending. They're spending um, money that we received. That we're spending money next year for money we received this year. So it has a carryover in the next year, no new revenue, and we're just spending it. So therefore we're deficit spending, right? It's natural with it. That's why I always like to separate in a multi-year projection out uh, unrestricted with restricted because the restricted side can, can just make it confusing what's really happening where we're really concerned on the unrestricted side for what our lifeline of our district is. Uh, so nonetheless, we've seen a drastic decrease in expenditures because of the uh, reduction in uh, one-time monies, those program uh, categorical funds that we've been getting. And so I uh, created here a slide that sort of shows um, I, so the carryover dollars, what's left with some of those monies, for instance, like the e-log. We have about $528,000 carryover from this year into next year. Well, we've budgeted all 528,000 of that next year in salaries and benefits. That's still, we have enough, we believe we're gonna have enough money when we close the books to pay for those literacy and numeracy aids for one more year. But you can imagine after next year, when we uh, do budget adoption, and believe it or not, we'll touch base with that in the multi-year projection because those literacy and numeracy aids are sitting in our multi-year projection in year two and three. But that's, those will be dis discussions when we actually adopt the budget next year, because always when I say, well, I'm not going to say it now, I'll say it when I get to the NYP. But nonetheless, so we have $528,000 left in ELOG. In the EEBG, we have about a million seventy-five, of which next year is 392 has been currently budgeted with the two being uh, the TOSA um, that Jay talked about, as well as uh, the coordinator um, in there. Yeah, that would be the coordinator of instructional programs. And that was a position I know last year, the board um, stated, you know, the position would be for one year and you'd relook at it again this year. And um, that will be in the EEBG for next year. That's a position with the new um, Mr. Dr. Greenlinger moving on to another assignment in uh, another district and the new assistant superintendent coming in, um, that's gonna be a critical position for us um, in the instructional area, curriculum instruction area. So that will be uh, out of EEBG. Yeah, and that's actually in there. Um, I know we, we said the TOS is in there for two, the coordinator's in there for three on the EEBG. Um, we also have the ESSER three, uh, 369, roughly 370,000. That's what I just spoke about for next year. 322,000 of that is going towards the Chromebooks. Uh, to reduce the the amount that lottery needs to expense on it and then we have the a through g completion grant about 136,000 137,000 of which we've budgeted uh, about thirty thousand dollars thus far for next year um, you can see that we have uh, expiration dates for each of those i'm fairly confident that we will um, meet or accelerate the, the um, I don't think we're gonna have a problem uh, spending uh, uh, the money before the sunshine dates for each of these programs. Can I ask the question, and just a request maybe for when we come back next week. Um, can we, can you bring stuff that's in the budget that is not in tonight's presentation, like the, the recurring things like the garden program, is that in here? Cane and shuttle, is that in here? Club Oak Park, the cafeteria. Yes. Like, yes. You know yes. what I mean? Like all those recurring things. Uh, yeah, they're all in there. That, that they're all in here just yeah. to make sure that, like, did the cane and shuttle go up? Like, are we, are we We're projecting, more? we haven't asked, that that's currently projected at the $25,000 okay. that we expensed this but year. But if we could see a yeah. schedule just with the, you know, the things that we always the, talk the, about. The little things go back in my time of what have been sort yes. of the, the little uh, trigger, like the yep. hot, hot topics. Because these are all new things, which is great. Like the, the new position. But what's still in there? What's still in there, yeah. Okay. So 
Can I just clarify? Is the are the literacy and numeracy aid? I can't see. I'm sorry, but my that, eyes aren't good. Yeah. Are the literacy and numeracy aids in the on in the general fund? No, they're in e log for what they're in carryover e log funds for next year. Okay. Okay, but in the multi year projection when we get there, they're in year two and year three of the general fund. Okay. As a project, purely as a projection. Okay, because that was a difficult thing to do when we before the pandemic. Yeah. Having to lay, you know. To, to downsize that was not good and so i just i'm just wondering how we afford that well so, yeah so we've afforded that for one more year to off to push that expenditure away but we're going to have obviously a decision to make um when we had prior to budget in year two, for next year two next year to say hey um when it comes time for um march are for layoff notices is that is are the literacy and numeracy things are something that we say hey once again this is something that's part of our that's why i put it in the multi-year projection to say hey is this something that we see as part of our core program therefore regardless of of separate funding sources that we say hey this is something that needs to be in there and therefore we'll take uh, general fund dollars if there are oh, no other one-time monies to expense it so adam when we come back and look at this again could you also provide a summary of the existing positions that that we are funding with one-time dollars and so put that in one bucket and then and then either next to it or below it the the proposed right the new the new positions that we that we went through like um like the wellness counselor the um what else is there is there anything else besides the wellness counselor that we're well college he knows a plenty college yeah. college and career yeah. there's a, a lot of uh because because i'd like a holistic picture of what are all the positions that we're currently or plan to fund with one-time dollars that will potentially carry over into general fund and then that has then we have then we have a complete picture of Right? Are we going to be able the, to fund all of that? The the only all of all of those things that you're talking about mm -hmm. are being well. Okay, I, I take it back. I mean, I, I, the, that list is at some point. I mean, bottom line, yes, I can do what you're asking in yeah, terms of any, anything that's sitting in there that currently, like the uh, one TOSA, your coordinator. Mm -hmm. That at some point you have a TOSA and a coordinator, and that needs to come back to the general. It's realistically, it's uh, I can think of three off the top of my head. It's your mm -hmm. coordinator, the TOSA. And your literacy and numeracy aids mm -hmm. that's everything right there those are those are the things that um you that are going to expire at some point the literacy and numeracy the the tosa in the court tosa is in year three right now because we're funding it for two years so it's in year three of our myp currently mm -hmm. our the coordinator is not in the myp at all because we have them for the th for this year plus two mm -hmm. and then currently in our myp we have the literacy numeracy aids starting in year two and three and Adam, when you say TOSA, you're talking about tech TOSAs, right? Tech TOSAs, yeah. yes. Learning support is not one time, right? It's no, learning support we're, we're using um, okay. unrestricted. Okay. Okay. Moving on. Uh, this is just looking at the combined. I think we went in detailed length and our salaries and benefits uh, combined. Looking at our combined expenditures, about 87% go to of our total expenditures go to people and benefits. And then we go to the last one. This is this is the, the crescendo, right? The simple it's a really a simple math equation. So we currently have an ending fund balance, right? That we project projected our estimated actuals that will change at one point, I would like to maybe do a checking for any Jay Greenlinger, um, what will cause our uh, beginning fund balance maybe to change between now and after we start school. That's okay. Do you know? Okay. Well, the, we'll have unaudited actuals. So we, when we after we start the school year, we'll have our unaudited. We're, right now, these are estimated actuals. We'll have unaudited actuals, and what that will truly tell us is what is our true starting balance for this current year. So our our ending fund balance that will change. All right, which becomes our beginning fund balance for 
next year. It's going to change. That I can, I can tell. If, Bry if Byron hits that right now, um, I, I don't know. I, what do you want, Byron? What do the kids want for Christmas? <laughs> I'll, they get it. Um, because that number will change. So our beginning fund balance, and more likely, to, I, I would assume it would change in the positive that some expenditures um, that aren't realized um, as vacancies continue to fall off of the books um, and we reap the savings of vacancies, that um, that number will um, increase for us for the starting of the year. So ultimately, that's the math equation. You have revenue and expenditures, and uh, you take how much revenue you have mi minus your expenditures, and you, from that you either have a net increase or a decrease to whatever money you have there as a fund balance. And so you look at your beginning fund balance, and then you could see there we do have a red number that we're currently based on the assumptions we know today of the May revise that I've included into this, um, uh, we're deficit spending by 168,000 on the unrestricted side. And you move that down, I've assigned $386,000. This is the unspent lottery funds from this year that we will carry over to add to whatever we receive next year. Um, and ultimately you take our fund 17 plus our other unassigned gives us a total available amount. This is what we use. This is what your reserve has to be. This is why we separate our unrestricted from our restricted. Um, the total unrestricted amount is 7.17%. And yes, we do meet the minimum reserve of 3%. And Adam, lottery funds cannot be used for salaries, correct? No, we can use the lottery funds. How you don't? Um, yes, you. I, I've used them as a negative write-off to. Well, that's what I meant. Yeah, use that's how I use in them. that form. Yes, in that form. Yeah. And once again, but then when you actually, hey, I, I predicted that you could see it, and that's why if, if when we looked at our um, MYP, you could see it on the restricted side. What did I say? We have this bigger ending fund balance, two point one million dollars, but next year we deficit spend by over a million because there's not new revenue coming in. We're expending. We're expensing carryover dollars. What's the unassigned, unassigned again? The 2129? 2129. That's any money that has fallen to our ending fund balance. Okay. So that hasn't been expensed on the unrestricted side. Got it. So it's just unassigned. There's unassigned. No, got it. Yeah. And so you could do plenty as a board. You can do, you can assign it, which is I'm asking you to assign the, in the past, we've assigned it for other things. You could actually commit it. There's a lot of school districts right now who are, because the reserve cap is going to be hit, that 10%, they can't maintain the, the rainy day fund for the state um, is going to exceed 3% with the governor's proposal. Um, so therefore, it means that their um, reserve for economic certainty can't exceed 10%. Mm -hmm. And because of that, all the districts, you know, who are at 18, 20% right now, they're adopting board resolutions to commit funds because your commitments don't count towards your reserve. So you can imagine that they're taking yeah. all those excess reserves and committing them for things like uh, f future uh, pension costs, uh, future technology and those types of things. If and only, committing- If only we were so lucky. If yeah. only we were so lucky. What is stores? What are stores? Stores is essentially um, uh, inventory that we might have on hand right now, correct? Oh, student store. It, Got it. Yeah. Well, no, no, it's it's really it's inv it's inventory at the district. If you a lot of districts actually house a warehouse. We really keep paper is our is our inventory at our warehouse. Others districts would actually have pencils, uh, color paper, where teachers would actually be ordering from the district warehouse and not say from uh, uh, Office Depot or school um, Southwest School Supplies. Okay. Um, that takes me to our MYP. We're getting to the end Darryl, there. Everybody. Hold on, just one second. I just yeah. want to go to our vice president, Dr. Derek Ross. Any any comments on the reserve? He'll no, probably keep them. He'll probably keep them until the MYP. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm waiting until the MYP. The next <laughs> okay. Time. But thank you for asking. Okay. So I'm always going to say my a uh, multi-year projection. It's a moment in time. It's a snapshot. Um, Mike Fine, I, I can't coin this myself. Mike Fine from FICMAT says a multi-year projection is a, approximately right and exactly wrong. Um, it is what it is. It's a projection. This will constantly change. We'll never take this one snapshot 
in time and take it as gold for the rest of the year. We'll constantly adjust this. So you can see what our assumptions are that went into our multi-year projection. Uh, the vast majorities of these came from school services. Like I say, I stick with school services um, purely. And that way I can just stay consistent. Um, not cherry pick assumptions that I like or don't like to, to tell a story that I want to tell. Um, you so, could so like so one thing that I, I did notice and I was wondering where that came from and, and I think you've answered it, um, which is school services, the assumption around CPI which, that's school services. Wow. Yep. So they're 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 projecting three point one four for two thousand twenty three twenty four, but yep. one point nine seven for the following year. Yep. And that and there's and, and a lot of stuff that they're taking from is from uh, you know, calculate from the Department of Finance. Um, and and you know those types of things is the enrollment the same number as what we looked at earlier because 23 24 looks different Ooh, i hope you didn't catch me on a typo no, never mind you can look later no 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 i actually don't think i have enrollment you're actually let's see here for 23 24 22 23 uh yes 40 40 42 72 versus 42 68 you got me on four i apologize i've 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 decreased our enrollment um, in my MYP there my two numbers I'd have to check that yeah it is a separate number um, looking at this, so no, nonetheless here are and this is where you can see I am slightly concerned about our unduplicated percentage these are the numbers that because it's a three year rolling average that are. Um, uh, calculator that we get from FICMAT. We have an LCFF calculator. Byron doesn't have to punch all those themselves. That's, they equate what our uh, unduplicated three-year rolling average is based off of our historical data. I see how that number is continuing to increase. I'm slightly concerned about that. That my one caveat is that we are going back to the NSLP, which I've already recommended. So it would be up to us to try to figure out creative ways to get people to fill out that application. Um, you can see the three-year average, how that sort of helps us moving along, but nonetheless, we still are decreasing our ADA over three years. We would be in declining enrollment and in ADA. Another, but I do believe these are uh, conservative in terms of looking at our enrollment projections uh, based off what Stu has. Um, when that first week of October comes next year, that's when we take the snapshot in time of what our enrollment is, and the moment that happens, um, we change our assumptions and our calculations based off of that when it comes in. So, um, and I, I, my hope is, knowing that, it won't change our revenue for next year. Our enrollment for next year will only change revenue for year two. So there's no harm in being conservative on this right now. And so then going to the next slide, when you punch that into our MYP, you can see how um, that impacts the three years with our, you know, like I would say, a slightly conservative projections with the using the governor's may revise how it currently is. And next year, we have the 7.17% this year, 5.43% uh, next year, and a 3.51% the year following. So that does tell you that our um, Revenue is being outpaced by, because um, this is an unrestricted MYP, it's not uh, showing you restricted dollars, that our revenue is being outpaced by our expenditures based on our current assumptions. What, what's driving the increases in salaries in the outer years? Um, you have a uh, uh, stepping column, mm. Got it. as well as PERS and STRS. That's the benefit side. I get mm -hmm. that. Just Looking at yeah, we actually have a, um, and then also you can imagine on going back to it on the classified side, you're going to see the increase from the literacy and numeracy aids coming back in. Right, so that was my you would next see question. Those are in there. You would see um, on the certificated side in that year three, the TOSA coming back in. You actually see a slight decrease next year because we are taking the retirement incentive out next year that comes out of the multi-year projection this is the last year of it remember those who retired this year with the incentive it's part of our budget the that's in the budget is the retirement incentive we're approving that for next for the people who retired this year Adam, that comes out for the next two years 
Adam, real quick with the Persian stirs increase, I know for next year, it's uh, the stirs is going up 3%. Um, for 2223, what we have to pay as a school district. Um, within those three years, is, it, is there another jump within uh, those three years or is it uh, after that? Stirs, I believe, yeah, if you have the dartboard right there, Stirs, Stirs actually flat lines at the 19.10. Um, PERS actually comes down a slight bit even after, I think it, I think it levels at the 24.6. Yeah, at 24.60 sort of flattens out right now. I'm so happy Byron got to contribute to this. Um, nonetheless, we have our 3%. Oh, and, th and this is actually what I would say, is, is ultimately always take the multi-year projection in this lens, is prior to those out years happening, we're going to have this exact budget study session that we're having prior to to make any adjustments that we feel are necessary based on the goals that we have um, for our financial reserves. So the 3.51% that we see at the end of the third projected year is assuming the deficit spending that we are projecting now. And that's why you see the negative numbers yep. and the net increase, mm -hmm. decrease in fund balance. Yep. Mm -hmm. You see, you actually, you see how that, how that impacts um, based off the assumptions we have today. So in a way it's actually worse because we're getting to the 3.51 by deficit spending. Yes, absolutely. But, based on the things we know okay. today. It'd be interesting to go back and we always do this in my company where we try to, when we yeah. do a five-year plan, go back four years ago and look where we, where we thought we were going to be in three yeah. years. Like where did we think 22 and 23 were, was going to be three years ago? Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't seven point one percent. Oh no, we would have been that. right at three. Right. Yeah. yeah. So right I think but we've we've made some, but we I would say we've also made some very fundamental um, changes on how we approach fund balance. Right. I also think, like Adam keeps saying, he said it like thirty. Instead of you know, you said this like so many times, and you're so good to say it. Things could change. Um, a lot could be different. You know, between now and June thirtieth, when the governor has to sign the budget. You know, the legislature has to approve the budget by the 15th, and then Governor Newsom has until the 30th to sign it, and then the budget trailer bill rolls out after that. Um, the Senate and Assembly package is in very different than what the governor's may revise is. And so we don't, we truly, I think more than any other year, we truly don't know how different it's going to be. Is it likely there will be more money? Yeah. Is it likely there'll be less money? Probably not, but we really don't know. It's, it's such a difficult guesstimate, um, especially this year where the state is flush in revenue. It's really difficult. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say that it's, obviously things will change. Uh, like Dr. Davis said, the legislature has come with a, a much more rich plan to increase the base, but we don't know. Um, Bob Blattner, who we use, always you know, reminds us that it's not titled the governor's budget for any reason. The governor has the biggest uh, chip in the game. So, but nonetheless, I do believe we're going to, this will change and this will be different. There will be more money. We, de we definitely, the one-time discretionary dollars are going to come and how we go about with what, how we use those dollars. But of course, that's going to come to uh, before the board with, with our plan um, and, and all the impacts. Whether it's a 45-day revise or we address this all at first interim, um, and first interim is your um, actual expenditures from, from July 1 to October 31st and your projections from November 1 through July that we bring to you in December. So we can do it in two ways. You know, we can come back as part of first interim with whatever the governor's budget is and how it's impacted and what's the plan for those dollars. Or even prior to then, what's the plan for, say, the one-time discretionary dollars. And then you see it um, in, the, in the first interim either way. All right, any other questions or comments? So the next, Derek, do you have any? Okay, so next step, next week, you come back? Yes. With the additional items that we've requested? Yes. Hopefully? Okay. Yes, Byron's made notes. Okay. He did, thank you. Yeah. And we'll come back. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Byron. Thanks, thank Adam. You.
Thanks, Jay. Are you coming back down, Jay? Got it. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to B1C, review and discuss the universal pre-K plan. There we go. He's taller. Is that dramatic enough? Um, so this is, uh, as it says, the uh, universal pre-K plan. Um, all school districts are obliged to uh, create a plan for the transition to universal pre-K or the universal TK in our um, situation. Um, the plan was shared with the board. This was done collaboratively with uh, principals, preschool, um, and then included uh, Jennifer Golden, our um, soon-to-be uh, director of early childhood education and um, primary, her, uh, her primary role, her, one of her primary roles is to support the transition to universal pre-K over the next few years um, and to support the teachers at the preschool and UTK and then um, ensuring that continuum of DK to two um, takes into consideration the younger students that will be matriculating through those grade levels. So the plan itself um, is, does it takes into consideration for school districts that have um, significant state preschool programs. Um, we don't. We have our, our single preschool, which is not a state preschool program. Um, and so there's a lot in that plan template that just uh, minimally applies to us. Um, however, the support of teachers and support of students in this uh, slow rollout of the change in DK age is uh, material to, to our work. Um, so I'm open to any questions uh, to the board. Comments, questions? I just had a question about how or if it, how it affects our day for our preschool and our TK. Um, it will not impact uh, either schedule. So the pre, in terms of like, are you talking about like the, the, the day as in like the schedule? The day, no, not like what they do, but the length of the day. Uh, no. So our preschool is uh, is going to maintain the be, is able to maintain the same it, schedule. It is. It doesn't have to extend the day or mm -hmm. TK either. No. What we have to do in terms of extending the school day is to have opportunities, and so our opportunities are mo are most notably the club because the mm -hmm. club is open to TK students, uh -huh. um, and so that is something that is available to all TK students. So when you, but when you say opportunities, that's a pay pay to participate program, and that's mm -hmm. acceptable. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. We're not. Ob are we obligated to make that program free for students who are uh, low socioeconomic or anything? I know. This no. And so this UT UTK plan, the funding that aligns with it is for the transition. It's for the preparation of UTK. So it wouldn't be a source of ongoing funding for that. Um, there is a source of ongoing funding for that, and that would be the ELOP, mm -hmm. um, which uh, Mr. Ouch alluded to earlier. At, uh, the initial ELOP was a small amount, of, I think $160,000, and we've used that primarily to um, offer our summer remediation programs. We've uh, offered uh, growing outdoors classes and the summer club to students um, who, whose economic situation would preclude them from attending. Um, and I would imagine that our continued work with the ELOP would allow students who could not afford or who, based on their uh, status from the free reduced lunch program would be offered um, either a sub significant reduced rate or um, a, a compliment, complimentary free uh, scholarship, thank you, um, uh, for the club. So that would be separate from this, but we have to have opportunities for that to happen, but not funded by the UTK funding. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So I guess my overall question is in alignment with what Denise was saying, which is what are the changes and as a result of this mandate to our program in short. So they're mostly gonna be in instructional and um, kind of a classroom, I guess classroom management is the best way to say, because right now our DK classrooms could have students who are kindergarten age, but who might be present as a little bit immature. And so the instructional strategies and this the classroom strategies that you use for a just turned four year old and a about to turn five year old are very different. Those those children are very different in their development. So our TK teachers um, have uh, adopt have kind of adopted a, a classroom management, um, not, I guess curriculum um, called Second Step, 
which is allowing them to develop age appropriate structures um, for, for young students. And then um, we're also participating in a, a fair amount of professional development put on by the county and then supported by uh, Jen Golden, just to make sure that the strategies that we use are age appropriate as the age of DK students will, uh, will eventually go down by a, a, as much as a year. So it's only educational strategies, like just differentiating between those two age groups. Is that what you were saying? Not just instructional, but uh, I guess the classroom management and the kind of the social environment that's created by, by the teachers is going to look different in three years when um, we have children who have just turned four coming into the classroom, as opposed to now where it, it is much closer to, ki to a kindergarten class just because of the age of the children. Um, so, so because it's going to be a younger population, so yes. future facing. So to that end, then, are we going to need to change the staffing in terms of who we hire yes. and also the spacing? I think we're going to talk about facilities. So the okay, I'll talk, the staffing, yes. And I think in the um, in the in the budget uh, just presented by Mr. Rouch, it noted that there was an increase in DK aides. That's because there's a statutory requirement of a two to one ratio of children of children to adults. Um, so we would have to have aides in the classroom uh, the entire school day. Right now, our aides are 3.75, which means they're there for almost all the day, but not quite the whole day. And so we will have uh, need to increase the aid coverage so that they're there uh, whenever the children are there. So that's the staffing. 12, 12 to 1 this year, and then eventually 10 to 1 in full implementation. And it's also... Um... In terms of training for our teach for our teachers to be mm -hmm. working with the younger children, because when it's children even younger, obviously you know the strategies are different, behaviors will be different. Um, whether students are sitting and how they're sitting is different. You know, so it's a very different look um, when you have the younger children. Yeah, and we're lucky in that our currently our DK teachers are um, are very focused on play based learning, um, and while they know that there are some academic standards that they're beginning to work towards in DK, um, the focus is, is, more, is way more developmental. And that, will, that it, developmental focus will increase as the children's age decreases uh, because the children will come in not ready and not appropriate to begin a kindergarten program right away where they're, it's, it's closer to a preschool uh, setting at the beginning of the school year. Um, and as far as you, you began to ask about like groupings, that that's something that uh, I know uh, Jennifer wants to look at because we can't predict that the kids are not probably not going to come like you know eight percent from January and eight percent February and eight percent March. That's not the way that births work out. Um, so I know it's something that's in the back of our minds. We want to be able to look at: Are we going to have a young TK class or DK class, and then three regular like regularly dispersed? That that's something that we could have the flexibility with because we have added a fourth DK classroom. So there could be, um, there's a possibility that we could have like a summer DK class, summer birthday DK class, which would be our youngest DK students. And then the other three classes of everyone else. So it's a possibility, but again, it's really gonna be based on who enrolls in it. And we're, we're so small that from year to year, that's gonna change. I was just thinking, cause our schools are so close and we're mm -hmm. so small geographically. Mm -hmm. that where other school districts may not have that luxury. So Correct. That's why I was and, and I would note that following the state guide of the slow implementation um, was the right decision. Uh, some districts have gone uh, all in and said, we're gonna take in all four, four year olds now um, are somewhat scrambling because um, again, kids don't enroll 24 at a time um, at each school. So that, that's a logistical nightmare. Um, and I'm glad that we don't have that problem right now. Okay, I'm just trying to ascertain, you know, what the impacts would be and how much of a lift it would be in terms of, you know, staffing costs and and what that is. Um, is there a way to summarize all that in just a very high level bullet points? And I'm trying to sift through this document. It was it wasn't clear, so that's why we yeah. So the out these the, the implementation plan is really supposed to be focused on how are you supporting the group, like the implementation of the program. Um, and so it sounds like what you're asking is for that the page ten and eleven where uh, the guidance from the state is that they don't want us to do the um, long-term enrollment projections until the plan from implement until the plan for implementation is board approved. 
Um, and so I think that was in the notes when I first shared this plan because I asked the same question. Um, and so I think that's what you're saying, Ms. Wang, is like, if are we projecting out five year, four years to the full implementation and how many kids do we anticipate? No, enrolling? I'm not asking about the projections. Okay. I think okay, I, it's just trying to understand what this is entailing and we're supposed to be approving a particular plan and I'm not 100% clear about it even after reading through this. And then there's discussion about alignment for K through three, um, like the whole vision for this program, it would have been nice to kind of start out with the macro vision and why this is okay. even happening, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and what the CDE's intention of all of this, and I think that's just what I'm asking for, okay. is just kind of a very high level overview, not necessarily getting into the granular details, um, since we do need to approve this at the next meeting, is that what it is? Uh, before June 30th, so presumably. Mm -hmm. So what you're asking for is is a summary of our of our implementation of of UTK. Yeah, like, but what? But I think more about what do we have to do differently, spend differently, hire differently, um, curriculum changes that we anticipate. Is that that's how I think about it too? Is how right. will our DK be fundamentally have to be different? And how does that work with our existing yeah. preschool? Right. And then this whole thing that they have in here about how it's this uh, preschool through third grade alignment initiative, right? Mm -hmm. Read in research, and I know we have um, Tammy coming on board, and how that's going to integrate. Um, and then it says here as a best practice, the CDE recommends LEAs convene a public engagement process. So I don't know if that's necessary, given that some of the the learning communities they have here include Head Start mm -hmm. that don't apply to us. Um, so I just want to yeah. make sure that we're yeah. So we're, we're our plan is, is fully compliant. So we work with the C, with um, BCOE along the way, like the ELOP um, for this year. Um, most of the requirements are not fulfillable based on our district's just kind of unique size and then the funding that came along with this. Um, this is another one of those plans where our implementation. Uh, funding is like a tenth of what a similar size school district 15 miles away might be. Right. Yeah. No, and that's and fine. So, okay. I think it's just helpful to understand, you so, know, because it's in, it's everywhere. It's just, you know, why or why not it would apply, to what extent it would apply okay. to us. That would be so, helpful. Um, so I heard, how does this impact the preschool? How do we have to staff differently? How do we have to spend differently? And then are there, what, if any, curricular changes? Yeah, maybe it's three to four pages. Just summarizing it, kind of like you did for the Very LCAP. Simple. For the LCAP. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can sh even share it before next week's meeting. Or yeah. if is it due by? It's we have to. It has approve to be approved by June thirtieth. So. So we have one we more meeting to next. do it. Yeah. Right. This we can do uh, with Jennifer, especially with Jennifer's input. She has. A, a very clear idea of how Good. this will work. So, and and then even because um, I'm not even clear yet on where this is going to be. Is that is it going to? So I heard the preschool, but we also have the TK classes at our elementary sites. Mm -hmm. So how that's going to work through through our sites? Like, is it going to all be? It's not okay. all going to be at our preschool, correct? Okay. It's going to be a combination of the preschool and yeah, our uh, DKs, yeah. Each our, each site has its own DK sites. Okay, mm -hmm. and the, the preschool will add one. Is that no? The, no? Uh, we 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 have an additional DK classroom at Red Oak this year, this okay. coming year. Okay, so so none of this will be impacting the preschool, really. I think there needs to be conversations next year, starting because we will be adding more DK classrooms. Mm -hmm. What is that going to look like? What do those classrooms look like inside? Are we able to have bathrooms that are uh, up to code? Are we having mm -hmm. uh, the right staffing? Right. Now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so maybe so may, then maybe also like a page on so what these things like what have we have not figured out yet that we I still need to figure out for next year or year to come will be okay. facilities. Okay, all right, great, thank yeah. you. Okay, all right, I have my list. Thank you. Thanks, thank Jerry. You. All right, so I think we're on to our one and only action item on the. Uh, you want to stand with me? On the things. agenda, which is uh, B, where are we? B, 1D, establish the position of learning support teacher on special assignment and approve associated job description. So I think 
uh, Jay spoke uh, quite a bit to, to this already, uh, answered, I believe, a lot of the questions as well. Um, is there any other questions that you have maybe for me on the HR side? I think Jay already did a great job answering the curriculum instruction questions. So just to recap, uh, these are the three elementary learning support uh, teachers. teachers. We won't call them TOSAs, yeah. I yeah. think. Yeah. I think that's the right call. Yeah. Teachers um, to be funded by uh, unrestricted LCFF, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, general. Not one-time dollars. Correct, okay. general fund. Okay, general fund. Okay. And they're supporting, they're reporting directly to the site principals. Yes. Correct. Okay. Okay. And, they're, and they're at the each site. Full yes. Time. Great. Okay. Make sure. I think uh, something here that's in the job description that's pretty, um, I was going to say cool, but <laughs> it's not probably the best word to use, but um, that uh, training and supporting the instructional aides that we have as well. Um, they will be uh, doing that for us as well in, um, I think, in conjunction with the principals and, and our new assistant soup. So pretty cool stuff that's going to be, that they're going to be able to do. And that's just one thing. Great. And, and I think for these, um, I think I would really like to see, uh, you know, early on next year, early feedback that we, from, from teachers and from the sites about how this is working. I, I think this will be a great benefit. It will relieve a lot of the um, burdens that particular positions, I think, at the sites have been taking on in the pandemic. But I also think when you add new positions, you kind of still need to figure out how to best slot them in and how to best use them. Um, and so just wanting to make sure that we um, are responding to some of the feedback that we did get at the office hours to to make sure that we're getting that real-time feedback to, to, to be able to pivot very quickly or adjust um, quickly when things aren't quite working so that we can really uh, make the best use of these positions right away. Yeah, I think okay. it's, 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 it, it's in the, the job description as well to talking to the points that you're talking about, but I do I think it's, it's imperative that they have collaboration time mm -hmm. uh, with the, um, curriculum instruction department and then what things are working at their sites mm -hmm. and then even collaboration amongst the teachers at their sites and then how can they improve that so everything you're saying um, I think we're on board with that 100%. I, I also think it's really important we'll work we will work with our principals at the elementary sites to make sure that they message this appropriately um, you know these are the new positions these are what they're for this is what they'll be doing all this stuff you know even hand out the job description. I mean, I don't. It doesn't matter to me as long as the messaging is clear, the expectations are clear, like you're saying. And I also think, um, I think each quarter, it should be looked at and reviewed and seeing, you know, how it's working and so on and so forth. To, you know, um, even though the elementary schools work on a trimester basis, I think ten weeks is probably enough time to at least get an initial look at it and and see how we're doing. Thank you, Dr. Davis. All right, any other questions, comments? All right, is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank you. Good luck filling those positions. Uh, I think we're done, so we can adjourn. I, do we wanna talk about, can we talk about the date for our retreat? Okay, all right, so after I adjourn. So let's adjourn at 8.22 p.m. Is there, a, is there a motion? Okay, is there a second? I'll second. second. Oh. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Derek's not here to he ask so many darn questions. Hey, Derek. Can we stay on? Uh, wait for Rogan.